morning. Uh, this is Joanne Gere. I'm the Executive Director of the Biopharma Research Council. Our webinar today is on Second Harmonic Generation Imaging and Quantification of Fibrosis of the Kidney. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our organization and then we'll get started. The Biopharma Research Council was founded in 2009 as an organization to bring together scientists, engineers, and IT professionals across all the different disciplines that go into biomedical research of drugs, devices, diagnostics, etc. Um, and we, our, our whole mission is to develop platforms for knowledge sharing and opportunities for researchers to find each other. Uh, we've had a busy year. We have uh, did a wonderful program on cybersecurity this July. We'll be doing it again next July in Princeton. Um, we did a virtual program on point-of-care diagnostics in August, and those uh, recordings are online from both of those sessions. Next week, we're at uh, Kane University's Institute for Life Science Entrepreneurship for our microbiome update. And the following week, we're very busy this month, the following week we'll be in Durham for uh, the Triangle Biotech Research Symposium, which is part of this D3D series, as is today's webinar, followed by our program on companion diagnostics. And the first time, we're doing a big expo on manufacturing, which will look at all the different complexities of developing biologics as well as um, uh, small molecules. Uh, and I just want to announce that the next webinar in this very series will be December 8th at 11 Eastern Time, uh, the Preclinical Second Harmonic Generation Imaging of Collagen in the Lung, Advanced Image Analysis and Collagen Quantification. The registration on that will be up soon and we'll be sending you a note. During this program, you're welcome to enter questions in your dialog box at any time. We will hear from our speakers, and then we will do all of our questions at the end. And here we go. <clears throat> I'm going to introduce Dr. Shen and Dr. Petajan. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from Dr. Petajan, who is an experienced leader with 20 years of executive level and international business experience in medical technology and life sciences, including 12 years at General Electric Healthcare in both product and business leadership positions. His technology expertise spans across the spectrum of physical instrumentation. He has extensively published and created intellectual property in the areas of molecular beam epitaxy, semiconductor band gap engineering, and medical cellular imaging. Dr. Li Shen, formerly with M-Clone uh, and Eli Lilly Company, Hoffman LaRoche, and Zeus Scientific, is an experienced pharmaceutical research scientist familiar with most in vivo and in vitro techniques and related workflows used in the industry. Her expertise includes preclinical and clinical programs for drug discovery and development in therapeutic areas including infectious, inflammatory, metabolic, and cardiovascular diseases, and oncology. Dr. Pettijan. Thank you, Joanne, for this very kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Pettijan, and uh, I run uh, Genesis Imaging Services in partnership with the ISTO Index from uh, Singapore. Um, I would like to make general introductions on, on what we do and, and who we are. Uh, but first of all, let me summarize what we want to achieve. Um, the goal that our organization is focusing on is to provide a very robust and translational method to quantify fibrosis. As we understand that there is an unmet medical need and an unmet clinical need in that space. We are using very innovative methods to reach that goal. Uh, first of all, leverage uh, newly released instrumentation from ISTO Index to do second harmonic generation and two photon emission uh, to PE imaging of uh, live tissues. This would be a uh, label free imaging technique. And then we're using validated machine learning, image analysis, and quantification algorithms to extract uh, the quantification of uh, collagen and related uh, conditions. The workflow that we have developed, including with the instrumentation, is very user-friendly to the pathologists because we, we start uh, with uh, paraffin embedded 5 micron sections, very conventional um, 
process steps, they wouldn't be stained. Then we image in our mid throughput system and then we do data analysis in an automated way um, and all of that is managed with um, you know, related uh, data and uh, SOP uh, procedures. Our business model is a paper use, paper study model, and down the road uh, when the technology becomes more mainstream, we expect that our audience will uh, start uh, buying the equipment. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of a background on these optical methods first. Uh, these are not new. What is really new is that you can have a desktop or a tabletop equipment. Um, and we fuse two methods in that equipment. The first one is a two-photon uh, autofluorescence um, that will come from several proteins in the cell. Uh, we have tuned the equipment uh, to image the autofluorescence of NADH, NADPH in the cells and that will give us the red images that you see down the road. They really give us information about cell health, cell metabolism and cell structure. And the second optical method that we use is second harmonic generation. Second harmonic generation is sensitive to um, non-centrosymmetric molecules and collagen 1 and 3 are such molecules and they will uh, basically uh, release uh, second harmonic generation photons that we capture in green. So uh, green is an artificial color of course, but we can see it here in our images and they will uh, basically uh, relate to collagen uh, structure and collagen content. Uh, we would see those in the extracellular uh, structure and when we combine our uh, fluorescence signal and our second harmonic generation signal and we colocalize them, uh, we obtain a stain-free, a label three, high resolution, non-disruptive and fully digital image of collagen in the tissues. Um, now let me give you some elements of scale as uh, Lee will show images here. The resolution that we use at 20x is about um, 0.3 micron per pixel. Uh, so let's make it simple and say it's one by one micron. And if we relate that scale to the different components of the collagen fibers, you will see that we operate at the collagen fiber level. So we can resolve the collagen fibers, we cannot resolve the collagen fibrils that are uh, packed into the fiber. So some of the images that you will see down the road as this one shows, you're going to see these wiggly green image. those would be collagen fibers and we resolve them extremely well as opposed to resolving at the nanoscale level the collagen triple helix. So this is an element of background that will basically uh, situate you. In, uh, in our space. Um, this is a typical uh, kidney image. You can see the uh, HNE uh, image at the bottom and our image at the top. Uh, green again would be collagen and red would be the cellular structure. We could of course zoom in and zoom out but the annotations here will help you relate to the different uh, features that we can see here and down the road uh, quantify. Of course, this technology can be applied to many tissues. This is why this is the third webinar that we are giving today on a kidney. We uh, gave um, a webinar on liver six months ago, on lung three months ago, and the way we develop applications follows a, a very rigorous um, development process. Of course, we can image all those tissues and we have collaborations with many sites to really explore what is the value of such image. Uh, but when we launch a service and a product, we also launch a validated um, image analysis software and, and we really start uh, using uh, image analysis tools to characterize the objects that are of interest. Then we um, validate those objects using machine learning algorithms with pathologists or experts and once the machine has learned we enter into a validation phase. More and more we learn that even in kidney 
we have different animal models and then we have the human aspect. So all tissues look different and we have to validate the image analysis tools for every specific tissues. But I just wanted to give you a heads up that we have this process here and what you will see uh, when Lee presents in the case study is really the outcome of a very specific image analysis uh, system. So this is basically what we do, uh, liver, lung, and kidney. Um, we have experience on several models, and um, we will uh, show you here how we work on quantifying liver features. Um, this is a typical image, and you'll see more of those. Again, to calibrate yourself, these would be the cellular structure in red, uh, autofluorescence, uh, label-free fluorescence, and in green would be collagen 1 and 3. When we extract the green channel, we will end up with these very rich images where even you know, at very faint level, we can measure collagen in, in all kinds of uh, forms and uh, our technique as a result is extremely sensitive. Um, Lee will show a study where we correlate uh, the collagen quantification with uh, conventional methods here. I just want to bring here a study that was done and published on liver, but I want to focus really here on the conclusion that says that these techniques really minimize intra and inter uh, operator discrepancies and they eliminate noise driven by staining or by operator uh, operations. So it makes the technique much, much more robust and suitable for multi-site and multi-investigator protocols. When it comes to, tech, to, to kidney, our methods after we do imaging and we end up with a green and red image, as, as you've seen, we uh, use um, machine learning image segmentation and we divide the tissues into regions, the medulla and, and the cortex. Once we've divided those tissues into regions for each region and also for the entire tissue, we would quantify the proportions of each area the collagen area ratio. We can also look into the collagen fibers morphometrics. Uh, here we, we can talk about thickness. And we also look at the collagen's network structure. So both um, region percentages, collagen, fibers, and network. Just to give you an idea, uh, this is how we would uh, quantify collagen um, content, we would look at a specific region of interest and then we can count the green pixels once they've been uh, treated, threshold, and relate that to the um, area of the ROI. Some um, collagen, for instance structural collagen, could be excluded from this computation and then we end up with a collagen percent. And this would be an area collagen percent. We'll discuss later about collagen density. When it comes to collagen structure, um, our algorithms will uh, treat and process the collagen signal and create the uh, skeleton that uh, could describe this collagen network. And once we have the skeleton, we can do many things with the skeleton, but one of the things would be to compute a collagen reticulation index, which corresponds to how much reticulation exists in that collagen network. So our idea and goal is really to quantify collagens in two dimensions. The first one would be the quantity of collagen that we can approach through the collagen area ratio. And the second one would be collagen structure which can be described by reticulation index. And when we look at a two-dimensional plot of those two parameters, again, content and structure, we could look at different ways collagen develops or uh, regresses. So here is, as an introduction to what Lee is going to present, what we call the uh, 2D fibrosis chart in the cortical area of a typical UUO fibrosis model. So every dot represents a, uh, an animal here, and we have uh, plotted on our 2D uh, fibrosis 
chart the development of collagen structures and the uh, development of collagen content in the tissue at day 7, D4, uh, 14 days, 21 days and 28 days and what we see very clearly in this model is that there is a development of both content and structure up to 21 days and after 21 days what we do is to to load, to thicken the structure, but the structure has been totally saturated. So in this study, um, we, we, um, we basically saw that the 20, what, 28 days was not a good and relevant um, point and we would be much more interested to see how the drugs or uh, compounds would affect the reversal of the development of fibrosis in this model. And that's what Lee is going to present you. Um, right after uh, this slide. Thank you so much, Matt. So today, um, today's case study, I'll be presenting the unilateral ureter obstruction induced kidney fibrosis in rat. Uh, the reference drug uh, used is the pifernodone. So this study uh, is with our partner GenScript. Very briefly on the study design, uh, we use SD rats uh, for surgical ligation of the ureter of the left kidney. The right contralateral kidney is used as control. The UO model is used to induce chronic epithelial injury, inflammation, and tubular interstitial fibrosis. There's three groups of N equal four to five. The group one is control. Group two is UUO plus vehicle. Group three is UUO plus pyphenidone. The study lasts about four weeks. Uh, pyphenidone or vehicle are given one week after the start of UUO surgery. Pyphenidone is an approved um, antifibrotic drug used to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, there are some research studies to show that uh, pyphenidone can be antifibrotic, uh, can be used as antifibrotic drug to treat um, other organs besides lung. So now we're going to the study images on our cloud-based digital image website, Wiki. Uh, you might have to adjust the angle of the screen to see the red and green images better. We'll start with the uh, control kidney. So the, the red color you see here is from two photon excitation. They're all the fluorescence from the tissue to look at tissue morphology. The green color you see here around these small blood vessels and in the interstitial area, they are from second harmonic generation for collagen. So in control kidney, the architecture of the uh, cortex and the medulla look very normal. So here we're looking at cortex. You have the glomerulus, uh, the small blood vessels, and the two wheels. And then we're going to move down to the medulla. The medulla is usually a little darker compared to um, cortex because the, the epithelial of the tubules are much thinner. Uh, in general, the, uh, the collagen um, in the medulla is a little bit more than um, the cortex. And I'm going to remove the uh, red channel so you can see the green collagen better. So the, the base level of collagen in the medulla and the, uh, the cortex is very low. Okay. So now we'll go to uh, the UUO group. So in the UUO group, uh, this is the left kidney where there's UUO surgery. There's a severe damage, architectural change in both the cortex and the medulla throughout the kidney. There is interstitial fibrous expansion tubular dilation, the inflammation and injury characterized by a dark shade of gray on top of the red tissue, uh, the fibrosis um, uh, accompanied with the elevated collagen deposition. So this is the cortex area and we're going to go through the whole tissue for you to see. There's a lot of uh, structural changes here. We see a similar phenomena in the, in the medulla as well, um, except that there's more prominent tubular 
dilation in the medulla area. So all this is the medulla. I'm going to look at another um, example. So this is also UO. You see uh, architectural changes, very uh, large tubular dilation, fibrous expansion, a lot of ele elevated collagen deposition throughout the tissue. And if I remove the red channel, you'll be able to see the collagen in the medulla area better. So there's a lot of collagen deposition in the medulla area. And we're going to compare this to the control medulla, which is, in, which is expressed in much lower quantity. This is the control medulla versus the uh, UUO medulla. Okay. So now we're going to go look at the, uh, the cortex of the UUO. If I remove the red channel, you'll be able to see the collagen better. Okay. Now we'll go to the cortex of the control. Okay. So the base level of the collagen in, in the cortex of control is very low compared to the UO cortex collagen deposition. So now we're going to uh, the UO plus pyrphenidone uh, treatment group. With the addition of um, pyrphenidone, it actually um, preserved the tissue very well. There is a large area where the tissue looks almost normal with additional pyrphenidone. There's still um, spots of uh, damage, but even those uh, small spots of damage with the fibrous area, there's very little, um, much less uh, collagen deposition. So this is a UO plus the pyrphenidone. The majority of the area of the tissue looks pretty normal. There's some small spots of damage, much less than compared to um, UO alone. So down here, you see small spots of um, fibrous area. And even, even these fibrous area, there's less collagen deposition compared to UO alone. Okay, this is the cortex. Now we look at the medulla. In the medulla, we see some other phenomena. The majority of the tissue is preserved. Um, there's still small spots of fibrous damage. There's, um, the tubular dilation is also less, and there's also less collagen deposition compared to um, UU alone. We can look at another um, UUO plus pyrphenidone group. This is another tissue. Now zoom in. So you see that with the addition of pyrphenidone, majority of the tissue is preserved. But there is, it's not 100% um, pure. You still uh, see uh, small spots of um, damage. So in this tissue, majority looks pretty good, except on the bottom here, you see some small spots of damage. And even these uh, small uh, spots of damage, there's less um, collagen deposition. And overall, there's less um, tubular dilation with additional pyrphenidone. So it looks like um, pyrphenidone reduces our uo induced tissue injury. OK, we'll go back to the slide deck. So now we'll go to uh, regional segmentation. Uh, on the left here, you see our 2PE uh, SHG image. The signal is pushed up to the max to help with segmentation. The process image on the right um, will show you that the, in the red is the cortex. The blue is the medulla. You also see um, a black area. That black area corresponds to the large blood vessels on the, on the image on the left here. So th this tells us that the, uh, the structural collagen is segmented out uh, from the uh, image analysis. This, um, this process image also tells you uh, the amount of uh, cortex area versus the medulla. It's also good to, um, to uh, segment the cortex from the medulla because part of the nephron is in the cortex. The other part is in the medulla. And, and different parts of the nephron have different function, for example, for secretion and reabsorption of various solutes. So thus, the, uh, the cortex and medulla, they have um, they serve different function. The image on the left also tells you um, overall qualitatively how much collagen you have. 
Okay, then, so this is the other two samples in the control group. And on the right, you see here that we segment out the uh, structural collagen. And this is the other two samples. So in this tissue, you don't see any blue medulla um, because there is no medulla here. So depending on the depth of the tissue section cut, you may or may not have medulla area. Okay, so now we're going to group two. So this is the UUO group. You see that um, there's a lot of fibrous tissue in the kidney. There's also elevated collagen deposition. On the right here, you see that uh, we segment out the structural collagen. It's a large piece of collagen here. Okay, and also I, I want to note that um, um, segmenting the cortex and the medulla in the UUO tissue is a bit of a challenge because of all the, um, the, the tissue damage and the structural changes, but we, we try our best using criteria such as that the, the cortex have the glomerulus the small blood vessels and that the medulla does not have these two items and that the, the, the tubules look different from the cortex. Okay, so we look at the other two tissues in the UUO. Um, in these two, t two um, samples, you see that there's um, fibrous tissue, there's elevated collagen deposition, and also a lot of um, tubular dilation. Okay, so now we're going to group three, uh, UUO plus pyrifendone. You see that overall, there's a, a decrease in uh, collagen deposition. Okay, and these two other um, samples as well. Okay, so now we're going to uh, regional um, segmentation, uh, the regional area percentage. We have the cortex here and we have the medulla here. The blue is the cortex, the red is UUO, and the green is UUO plus pyrifenidone. You see that um, cortex um, is about three folds more, in, more than um, medulla in the regional area. And as I said before, um, the, the regional area percentage may differ according to the tissue section cuts and also how we segment the, uh, the cortex from the medulla. <clears throat> so now we go um, to a rep small representative area of the, for each group. Uh, so this is um, uh, the cortex for the control. UUO and UUO plus pyfrindone. In the control, you see that there's normal tissue architecture. In the UUO, you see um, severe damage, uh, architectural changes, uh, interstitial fibrous uh, expansion, inflammation characterized by dark shade or gray, um, fibrosis with um, elevated collagen deposition. With the addition of pyfrindone, maturity of the tissue is preserved except for some small spots of the, uh, the um, tissue. And, and even these uh, small spots of damage um, area, you see uh, less collagen deposition. And if, if I remove the red channel, you'll be able to see the green collagen much better. Okay, so now we're, we're going to the medulla, the control UO and UO plus p -fermidone. In the control, uh, you have a normal tissue architecture. In the UO, similar to what you see in the, in the cortex, um, there is, there is a severe damage, there is a interstitial fibrous expansion, and a lot of a tubular dilation, inflammation, and um, fibrosis with a collagen deposition. And with the addition of pyfrinidone, much of the tissue is preserved. Uh, there's still small spots of damage, uh, including the, uh, the tubular dilation, and, um, and the um, inflammation, and the uh, interstitial fibrous expansion, but overall the damage is much less uh, compared to UU alone. And if I remove the red channel, you'll be able to see the, the collagen better. Okay, so now we're going to collagen quantitation. This is collagen area percentage. You have the total cortex and the medulla. Total is the whole tissue, including the cortex and the medulla, but we exclude out the structural collagen. Uh, the blue bar is the control, the red is UUO, the green is UUO plus pyfrindone. For total, you see that UUO surgery um, elevate collagen deposition about 5.3 fold more than control, and with additional pyfrindone, you actually have a reduction about 57%. We see similar ph phenomena for the cortex and the medulla. 
Um, so I also want to show um, uh, a little bit of data using conventional method. Um, for example, the hydroxyproline contents for collagen. Uh, this, this data um, shows you that UUO uh, increases hydroxyproline um, more compared to control, and this increase is reduced with uh, additional pifendum. So this data correlates very nicely with ours, but with our technology, we see a much higher range of um, differences, even with N of 4 instead of um, N of 6, equal, 6 to 8. And uh, with, um, with our technology, you see that UUO increases um, about 5.34 more of our collagen compared to control. And that um, with additional pifendone, you actually have a reduction of about 57%. Uh, but with hydroxyproline, what you get is um, UUO increases um, hydroxyproline about 2.64. And then uh, with additional pifendone, you have a 30% reduction. Um, I also have um, additional data provided by GenScript using the conventional method, uh, including the histology, uh, h and &E, and cyrus red staining. Um, overall, their data correlates very nicely with ours. And uh, if you drop us an email, we can uh, schedule time to show you additional data from here. So now we're going to uh, collagen reticulation index, uh, uh, or CRI. CRI is a measure of the complexity of the collagen network. The higher the CRI, the more complex the collagen network. You have the total here, the cortex, and the medulla. So for total, you see that our UO surgery increases CRI uh, compared to control, and this increase is reduced with additional pyrifenidone. You see similar phenomena for the um, cortex and the medulla. So now we combine these two metrics together uh, to, to make the 2D fibrosis chart. Y-axis, you have the collagen content. X-axis, you have the uh, collagen structure with the CRI. You have the control here, the UUO here, and UUO plus pyrifenidone here. So you see here that the UUO surgery increases not only the collagen content, but also the collagen structure. And this increase is reduced with additional pyrifenidone. So pyrifenidone works very well to reduce collagen content and also reduce the um, UUO-induced tissue injury. So this, uh, this concludes the, um, the rat UUO study. We're going to go into the uh, human kidney now. So um, in, in the interest of time, I will just show uh, one example of human kidney. So this is a fixed frozen human kidney um, tissue image from a biopsy. Although we uh, prefer uh, FFP tissue, we can also image frozen section. And so again, uh, this image uh, is coming from a tissue that's not stained. The image are uh, using a TP SHE technology. Uh, this biopsy is from a, a clinical patient who has, was determined to have mild fibrosis. And one thing that you'll notice that in this human uh, kidney tissue, you know, the interstitial collagen between the tubules, it's, uh, it shows up very uh, prominent with our SHG technology. Uh, we can use automated uh, quantitation uh, uh, software to quantitate collagen area percentage and collagen reticulation index. Automated uh, quantitation uh, software um, helps to elim eliminate uh, subjective bias and error. An image like this uh, can give uh, a value that looks something like this. Um, so our technology is fully translational, and we can image and quantitate image uh, from uh, tissue of either animal or human, so from preclinical to, pre to clinical studies. So with this, um, I'll turn the presentation back to Matt. Thank you so much, Lee. What I would like to show you now is um, some advanced capabilities related to our technology. What Lee has shown you is how we would use our methods and technology to apply those to, um, let's say, compound validations. Uh, we, we are not relevant for screening. We are very le relevant to validate the findings that you would have on a very serious lead and take uh, with you that lead from the later stage of preclinical studies to early stage of, of clinical studies. Once we have acquired our images, uh, and you understand that there are two channels there, one is specific to uh, 2PE and metabolism um, 
health. The second one would be much more about uh, collagen and only collagen. We can do advanced studies to basically support some hypotheses that you would have developed regarding the mechanism of action of your product. Let me show you a few of them. The first one is related to the uh, quantification, and I mean the very detailed quantifications of collagen strings, and that would apply to uh, studying the way interstitial collagen develops. We can quantify all kinds of parameters, and uh, these are the parameters that we would choose with you to look at uh, the way interstitial collagen develops or the way your compounds will block development of interstitial collagen. Uh, here is an example specific of uh, tortuosity and orientation. So um, on one of the kidneys, we have applied our algorithms. We take three regions of interest. So these regions of interest um, are user-defined. And we would uh, look at every single fiber and look at two things, their orientation along a horizontal axis. And that's why the data ranges from minus 90 degrees to plus 90 degrees. Uh, not only the orientation is measured, but what we can do down the road is deconvoluate these curves and look at the standard deviations of every single component, uh, such as this one that appears in region 2 that we don't see elsewhere. And here is the tortuosity. Tortuosity is the ratio of um, the distance, the straight distance between the two extremities of the fiber and the uh, total length of, of the fiber. So uh, this parameter is smaller than one, but we see really here um, the displacement of the total city peaks and distributions. So these are two examples of the things we can do in a very uh, rigorous study. Here is another feature related to our technique. What we are a pure optical technique and we're sensitive to uh, collagen, and here is the challenge. You have a rich, a collagen-rich tissue, in that case skin, but we are interested in the development of um, very faint collagen features at the edge of the skin here. We see them, the protrusions. Um, so the, the question is, how do you use a marker that is sensitive both to high density, collagen and low density collagen. And what we do basically here is combining a high intensity, high gain uh, image with a low gain image. So we would use the non-saturated uh, tissue here for uh, the deep layers of the skin and the highly, uh, the, the high gain images for the faint collagen. And when we combine them, here using computational merging, we, we're going to see very clearly both faint, which would be emerging collagen, and bright established collagen features in the same tissue. So it's making the relationship or relating that to a uh, conventional stain is just like if you were using a high density chemical stain and a low density chemical stain. So that's, that's actually not possible, and that's why we have some advantages in our technique. Another area of very high interest is the fact that by being quantitative to the quantity of collagen that is under the fibers, we can really distinguish uh, high-density uh, areas versus low-density areas. So here, this little drawing shows you that, in fact, those two uh, images would have the same collagen fiber area. But in this one, we have a brightest signal. In other words, we collect more second harmonic generation photons because there is more collagen under the same area. In other words, the fibers are more densely, uh, densely uh, populated with fibrils. And that density is also a way to show you how much collagen is in the fiber. Of course, there are considerations to be given to the way the tissue has been prepared and sliced. Um, but this is very relevant to the way and the quantity uh, we have collagen. So what is the best way to display 
collagen. Um, this is one way. I don't mean to uh, to say that we do that routinely, but this is one way. Here, for instance, there is the uh, 2D image, and the arrow points to that uh, object. In this 3D chart, the Z dimension relates to the density of collagen or the brightness. And it's always useful to look at the relative scale of brightness to really see that actually there are very big gradients of collagen densities in the tissues we are studying. And this being a 3D image, there is a host of visualization and quantification tools that can apply. Um, just to give you some, some reference, that, that little object that we see here is, is in 3D seen in this area. Uh, this is another, another example. Um, we, we are really able to quantify both uh, 2PE and second harmonic generation uh, objects. This little um, collagen features that you see here at the back of the yellow arrow would show very clearly here. And you can take um, trans uh, sections of this data and really see at the relative ratio of collagen in these areas or in the uh, center area. And the third example that I'm taking out of what we do in liver would be to really focus on a specific feature of your tissue. In this example, we are looking at the septal uh, collagen, the bridge between um, portal veins, and um, validate some hypothesis on the mechanism of action of a compound. This is, this is published work, we'll be able to, uh, to show you that. But there is a, a mechanic, mechanistic hypothesis on the role of this compound on the collagen bridge. And, um, you know, these are two tissues, uh, CCL4 in liver. The only point that I want to make is that we have developed uh, semi-automated tools that would really look at every single feature in, in your tissue. Uh, these features are broken down um, and analyzed, quantified, and we end up with um, you know, a lot of data on one single tissue that helps uh, to compare vehicles and compounds uh, on different tissues. And the uh, quantity of data that we obtain on, on a few tissues allow us to support in a very different way um, the way that your mechanism is going to impact a, a tissue, the way your drug is going to impact a tissue. So these are very recent developments of the way we developed image analysis and quantification tools. Of course, there, are, uh, there is a host of image analysis and quantification tools available in the market, and you probably have in your team some experts in that field. Our images are fully compatible with all kinds of systems, and uh, uh, your experts can also be a resource uh, for you to analyze those images. So, so in summary, and I don't think I want to read that slide in, in detail, but we've tried to show you that this new technique is much, much more robust to quantify uh, collagen, that we have developed specific expertise in the area of liver, lung, and kidney. Um, it can be used to really uh, support uh, the validation of a compound. So we'll call that uh, to validate the compound and go from the late stage of preclinical research to early stage of clinical research. And last but not least, all the images that you would do during a study can be processed later to uh, study specific features that can support your uh, mechanism of actions hypothesis. Thank you so much for your attention. I think Joanne will be able to take a few questions uh, now. Terrific. Thank you very much for that presentation to both of you. Uh, we have a few questions, which I'll share with you in a moment, but I do want to encourage everyone. There's a, a dialog box on the right-hand side of your screen, and please enter any questions that you have. So we'll begin with, how far into the future will you go from rat to human samples? Um, I, I, can, I can start with that one. Um, so we are already doing human, 
human samples. Uh, anytime biopsy is permitted, we are very interested to look into uh, the transplant space to use this technique to quantify um, donor tissues. Mm. Great. Um, is this new technique, IP, is the intellectual property on this new technique protected? Or how is it protected? Yes, uh, the, the, there are two aspects. Uh, the first one is the uh, instrumentation, the method. Um, as I mentioned, our partner Isto Index out of Singapore is a spin-off out of the ASTAR uh, research uh, ecosystem and uh, Isto Index has basically uh, commercialized the IP that was generated in all these uh, research institutions. The second level of IP would be the one related to the method or to the image analysis software. In the area of image analysis, we rely on copyrights. copyrights. And in terms of methods, um, we are um, not very aggressive in the area of methods. We want to leave that open to any investigator in the US. Thank you. Um, I think this is sort of a projection into the future, but how do you see that these tools can be used for diagnostics and or uh, by pathologists that is to determine disease and treatment? Yes, absolutely. It, it's, it's, it's not a long, it, it, this is going to happen sooner than what we think. Uh, first of all, uh, Isto Index commercializes in China and uh, it's currently used in the area of liver as a way to, as a tool to help uh, pathologists and doctors uh, stratify um, fibrosis in the area of liver. Um, Isto Index is applying to the Chinese FDA and the system will be hopefully uh, FDA approved in China early next year. We are following the same path in the US. We have a plan to take this through uh, regulatory authorities, but as you all know, uh, the claims here have to be very, very specific to the intent of use uh, we want to claim. Uh, this system is a combination of instrumentation and software, so we are uh, very cautious and very rigorous to submit a, a relevant application. So we have not submitted anything right now uh, because we are preparing uh, such applications. Okay, um, what is the turnaround time for sample capture, preparation, imaging, and analysis? Lee, would you like to talk sure, to that? Sure, um, for about 30 samples, um, the whole process will take about two weeks. Um, in, in about two weeks, uh, all that will be completed and then uh, we'll, we, we'll reach out to you to schedule a time uh, for, to show you all the data from imaging to uh, the quantitation. Of the, of the images. So it's, there's, no, there's no easy answer then, huh? <laughs> Great. Um, here's another question. Um, are, are all these other tissue types under development are only with software tuning, I guess? So Genesis 2000 can be updated uh, for other tissues? I think it's sort of a statement and a question. Do we agree with the statement and how do you answer the question? Um. So, yes, the, the physics will work with any kind of tissue, so, so that's why we can image liver, kidney, bone marrow, GI, heart, brain, <laughs> we even done hair. Um, so so the, the, the system can be tuned to any kind of systems and not only tuned for fibrosis but for any other kind of, you know, um, molecule that would uh, respond to um, intrinsic uh, fluorescence or uh, second harmonic emission stimuli. Uh, so, so the Genesis system can be uh, adjusted um, for specific intents. Our goal here is really to be very, very good at fibrosis. But the platform has many, many upsides and um, I would say that what we do here probably consumes 15%, maybe 20% of the capabilities of the instrument. Are there teams around the world that are also working with the instrument and other, for focus in other areas? Yes, 
Um, exactly. Um, the instrument has uh, multiple capabilities. There are teams everywhere. And as a matter of fact, if you're interested, we can um, let you know who they are and what they focus on. Uh, but the idea is, again, once you have a technology platform, is to develop applications that are uh, meaningful. And uh, we have chosen to do uh, you know, preclinical and early clinical fibrosis. Okay. New question. Has Genesis overlaid their images with other imaging modalities to create a more complete picture? Uh, yes, uh, we call that uh, multimodality imaging. It's a big trend. Um, so I wouldn't say that we have done it. I think our users have done it. Obviously, uh, we can fuse our images with uh, conventional pathology images and uh, create um, images that have much more information and treat the fusion of those images in a uh, much more uh, meaningful way. So I would say we, we don't do it because we, we only have, we already have two channels to handle with a lot of information, but our clients and users are doing it. Great. Uh, besides cellular imaging, can you image biological compounds such as MAB? Same person, I mean PK yes. biodistribution type yes. imaging from tissue yeah. selection slides. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't want to say yes when we don't have, we have not done it. Um, so I would be very open to try that specific question. I don't have any data to share. Um, but it's very easy to explore. So we can touch base after the call. And if you have specific questions, we can take a look to your tissues, uh, have a few images, and then discuss if there are features that can be revealed in a better way. Uh, and then we will move to uh, image analysis. Beautiful. Dr. Shen, what has not been mentioned yet that must be mentioned today? I think uh, we, we cover a lot. and. Um, and Mac did a really good job in answering all the questions. Um, I just want to say thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and Dr. Petajin, is there anything you'd like to make sure we talk about today before we part? Uh, you know, I think it always helps to put a price tag in front of a new technology. Uh, because we can dream about, you know, this is great, I'd like to do it, but at the end we all have to manage budgets. Um, just to give you a, a very rough idea, this, these methods would be three to four times more expensive than an HNE &E study, maybe four to five, depending on how many samples and, and others. So um, that's why I say it, 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 the price point makes it a very good technique for validation studies or pre-IND studies, right? Before you reach that stage where it makes sense to allocate a significant budget to move your compound through the system, um, the method would work, but we would have a hard time to compete with HE just from a budget perspective. Now, having said that, you could look at us to do imaging, just imaging, and once your compound has gone through the natural selection of, of compounds, we can always come back to those images and discuss with you what is the most relevant way to quantify specific features or to look at, um, you know, investigation or hypothesis-driven image analysis. So I hope this budget comment helps everyone. Oh, beautiful. Well, I want to thank you both for your presentation today. We've had some really wonderful active listeners and some great questions. And we'll see everybody on December 8th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.